flashed once and it's still flashing. Right. <coughs> I tend to have a little bit of a quiet voice, so if my voice does drift off and you can't hear me at the back, please shout out and wake me up. <coughs> I'm going to talk today about OData. Um, the title, <coughs> What on Earth is OData, actually sums it up because that was my first comment when I looked at the WMS3 release <coughs> notes and there was the PowerShell Web Services and OData and it was, what on earth, well, the polite version is, what on earth is OData? <laughs> so a little bit about me, um, I'm director of PowerShell.org, uh, responsible f among other things for helping put the summits together, been an MVP for <coughs> eight years now, uh, I've written some books, do some blogging, speak now and again, um, do some stuff for the scripting guy, survived <coughs> 25 years plus in IT, and I currently work for a company in the UK doing automation around cloud services, which basically means I get to play a lot. So what I'm going to do is actually sort of talk you through my investigation into OData. Um, when I decided I was going to cover this topic, I uh, couldn't find an awful lot of information about it. Uh, so it's basically what I've uncovered, where the gaps are <coughs> in what we currently know or what I could currently find out, cover what it is, uh, cover how we use it, what it does for us in terms of does, is it a good fit for our admin processes, can we leverage it to do stuff for us, and when or even if we should be using it. Uh, I'll just put this up to begin with. My conclusions, they're all based on what I've discovered and how that fits in with my organization and the organizations I've worked with. You may find that you have a different viewpoint, either after <coughs> playing with it yourself or listening to what I've got to say. <coughs> so to answer the, the question in the title, OData, contrary to the heckling that was going on at the before I actually started, um, which if you talk to them tonight, they'll like, explain what they were on about. It's open data protocol. It's a method of accessing data through a RESTful API. Now you all know what that means. Yes, no, no, yes. okay. No. Has anybody actually played around with any of the PowerShell low data stuff? Come up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What it basically means is that you've got some kind of data store that you're exposing through an API that you access over HTTP. You give it a URL, that accesses the, the underlying data model and pulls the, the data out. The important thing to note is that it's not just relational databases you can stick behind this. Um, as you'll see a bit later, you can actually access the output from PowerShell commandlets through this. If you want to dig into this a little bit more, the odata.org has a lot of wonderful documentation. Um, enjoy. It's dense and there's an awful lot of it. So in terms of OData and PowerShell, we've got three main areas. PowerShell Web Services, which were introduced in WMF3, if I remember correctly. It's, just to be confusing, it's known as Windows PowerShell Web Services, and it's also known as the Management OData IIS extension. Thank you. It's and that's the, the, the RESTful data access protocol. We've got a couple of commandlets, which I think came out in th version three as well. Uh, invoke web method, invoke rest method, which allow us to uh, talk to web services in general and RESTful APIs. And then in WMF5, we've got the OData utils. Have you, anybody played around with those? Oh, we see something new then. What are the OData utils? 
do is it's basically a commandlet that you run against an OData endpoint and it generates a set of commandlets to work with that um, OData endpoint uh, to perform the, the standard CRUD actions. That's create, read, update, and delete. So you get get, new, set, and remove against all of the actions you can perform on the uh, OData endpoint. To install it, um, use your favorite configuration tool. Um, given this audience, probably DSC. You need the couple of IS, IS, IIS features, so the web server, tracing, the IS extension for management OData, and there's a sample OData set of code that you can download as well, which gives you a role-based access uh, endpoint. And for that, you need the HTTP activation and the various authentication <coughs> methods. All right, this OData web service <coughs> sample, um, that's the URL to download it. I've got good news and I've got bad news for you. The good news is it provides some example code, it provides authentication against the endpoint, and it sort of gives you a sample of how to use it. And I do mean sort of. The not quite so good news, um, <laughs> it's, it's written in C-sharp and you need to compile it, um, which means Visual Studio 2010 or 2013. <coughs> you don't need that on the box that you're actually running it because you can just pick the thing up. It's, it's, it's an IIS web service. You can just copy it and shift it over. There's a script in the setup folder that will configure IIS for you and will actually copy everything uh, to the place it belongs. That seems to work fine. Um, the config, some of the config stuff, I, somebody needs to look at that because it's calling DISM to actually install stuff. We've got PowerShell commandlets, why aren't you using them? Um, and the, the sample, assumes a couple of default uh, accounts on the, the local machine just to get the thing working. Right, so let's start having a look at this. And we'll start here. <coughs> so what do you actually end up with when you've finished installing this is something that looks like machine that looks like this and as you can see you've got web server IS stuff and you've got the where is it yeah there, the management O data extension it doesn't it isn't even part of the IIS feature list uh, lives all by itself so, how do you use it? You need a credential because it won't work, uh, or the sample won't work without a credential because it's because of the ARBA uh, functionality. You, like all web services, you have to give it a URI uh, or a URL, depending on your preference. Uh, in this case, I'm just going against the local box. It runs on port 7000. That's just the default within the setup script. If you want to change it, feel free. The, the rest of it is just built into the code. Um, so if you look at this, that's telling you the box that it's on and how to find it. That's describing the web service. And that bit, the last bit, yeah. The last bit is telling it that we want to pull processor information. And that's a fairly standard sort of format for this sort of stuff. And so we'll do that and we'll run it. Uh, 
and you better damn well work. <laughs> So this process part is something that is built into the yeah. web service? Okay. Yeah, so with any web, uh, any RESTful API, you have something that describes how to get to the um, API, and then you have something that um, tells it what you want to get hold of and what, what, what you actually want to do. That's not looking promising. Let's stop that. Right, more good news. By default, that's what you get back. <coughs> and this bit up here, the content, uh, it's a whole bunch of XML. Gee, joy. <laughs> oh, it's an ug. Ug. Yeah, that's not quite what I said. <laughs> OK, so to make it a little bit easier to deal with, um, because we haven't really got anything nice and easy to convert XML into something we can work with. Um, you can switch to using JSON. Everybody know what JSON is? Yeah, and it's not the six people that we've got attending. It's JavaScript object notation. It's a cheap and cheerful, lightweight alternative to XML. And if there's any developers in the room and you don't like that definition, <laughs> so we send off, yeah, let's just skip that, we get the stuff into content, run the content through convert JSON, and then you end up with something looking like that, and you can begin to see there under the value property that things that look like they might just have something to do with processes. So let's just dig into that a tiny little bit more. And there you are. And yes, I know this is a long-winded way to get hold of process information off a box, but processes, a Windows box will always have some processes, so it's a good sample data set to work with. And you can filter it. So this is where the syntax gets beautiful. Mm -hmm. So you've got this dollar filter equals brackets handle count GT 1000. And then you've got the ampersand for the <coughs> dollar format. This is standard OData syntax. It's all described in that URL I gave you. Um, it's you just got to live with it. So, where would we want to run? We want to run that. And then we'll pull this back. And so you can filter the data. If you notice the URLs I was giving, I put them in single quotes. Why did I put them in single quotes? Dollar. Dollar. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't like it if you don't put it there because it tries to. It pardon? Yeah, if you look there, it says dollar filter. PowerShell. If you don't put that in single quotes, PowerShell will treat it as a variable that you're trying to substitute. So don't use double quotes either. Yeah, you, that's the thing that you find out the hard way at ten o'clock at night when you're trying to put the demo together. <laughs> If you want to actually start pulling something back by process name, it, it then gets even more joyful because you've got to put that in single quotes, but you've got to double them up to escape them. Does the PowerShell escape character work there, the back tick? I didn't try it, to it be perfectly if, honest, because I, I was... If you, were a, if you were in a double-quoted string, you could back tick the dollar sign. And then you right. Yeah. Yeah, so you could escape the dollar sign and, and force it to be um, a literal, or you could um, 
use the escape characters. There are ways and means around it, but I was want I was want I did it this way just to demonstrate the, what you need to do. Okay, so <coughs> let's just run that little lot. So, Richard, I have a context question. So. This O data means ha having that at some sort of URL, right? No, this means bit. That, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Means that somehow my management data is stored at that URL yeah. site. So basically, what happens is when you go and, or in this case, when you go and send that off to the O data endpoint, right. it's effectively going off and running the PowerShell command in the oh. background and then serving the data up to you. It's not caching the data, it's... Right. Um, so it wasn't there to begin with. No. Back. It's actually yeah. being so, fed in. Yeah, so if we, if we sort of ran this a lot, you'd right. see the actual uh, the data changing. Right, so, so you wouldn't, you'd never use this to, to get processed, but the point would be then that there's management data that's not available in any other way or from yeah. a RESTful web service. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you, you if you, yeah if you're talking about going to uh, another data store such as a, a database, <coughs> it, each time you would fire off the uh, the request to the RESTful API, it would go off and query the database <coughs> and pull back the latest set of data for you. Right. I, I think one of the challenges that I've had with using um, the web commandlets is figuring out which services actually provide data in the format that I need it and when to use invoke web request and when to use invoke rest method? Okay, my quick and dirty uh, on that is that I would use, if I'm going up against a RESTful API that's giving me JSON back, I would use invoke rest method, which I'll come on to in a little, a little bit. If I want XML back, um, I'll take uh, the uh, take, take right, either. Request. If you're just going against a non RESTful API, use the uh, web method. Um, or use the, there's another command that can't remember its name off the top of my head, but it basically will create a set of an object that proxies the endpoint. New web service proxy. That's the one. Okay. And you then get a, an object with a set of methods on it, each of which matches the thing. That's actually a good thing to run to find out what's going on at the other end. Yeah. But that's for uh, for SOAP. Yeah, yeah but that's, oh, for, yeah. that's for SOAP based ones. It doesn't work for the RESTful APIs. Uh, so. And to follow up on what June was saying, if you, the advantage of using the uh, invoke rest method is that it does the JSON conversion for you. So we're using the same URI and get similar data back. We can also work against services in this example, standard service data. And again, you can filter, uh, which I'll make all this code available as part of the uh, download. So you, again, you can filter on things like service name. And, and again, someone wrote that web service to specifically say, I can get processes, I can get services. Right. Yeah, this is, this is where it starts to break down in that the the example works fine for pulling process and service data back. You should also be able to manipulate them, so things like stopping and starting services. There's supposed to be a white paper on all of this, but all of the links are broken to it. <laughs> so I, following up on <coughs> Kenneth's comments about documentation, I was having a long chat with him at lunchtime, sure. explaining, please sir, our documentation's disappeared. Can we have it back? Um, we'll try and find it. Uh, same with up, up, update actions. They just, I just can't figure the syntax out at the moment, moment to get them working. Because they're not responding to the way that I would expect these sorts of things to behave. So, as I said, it's uh, the web service uh, maps the CRUD actions to PowerShell commandlets. Um, 
That's described in a schema.mof and a schema.xml file, which I'll show you in a little while. And then you've got a, another XML file for controlling the uh, RBAC configuration. And I'll just quickly show you those, because they're lovely to read. And I know you all love reading XML or MOF files. Anybody doesn't? Yeah, what am I looking for? MOF file isn't there. So, standard looking MOF file uh, describes the object that's coming back. If you played around with uh, WMI at all, you'd be used to looking at these. The XML is uh, very similar, so it defines the, defines the resources that we're putting in, service and process, those were the two things that I was putting into the URL. And then it comes down and shows you the the command that you're actually using and the parameters that you're allowed to use on it. And that's all very nice. What tools are there for generating that schema? Big pardon? What tools are there for generating a schema like that? Yeah, that's the next bit I'm going to come on to. Okay. I'll, I'll, can I just hang on for a couple of minutes and I'll, I'll cover that one for you. So the if you want to add users into this, it's fairly straightforward. You just add them into the uh, RBAC configuration XML. Uh, unfortunately, it's you add them at the user level, not at the group level. Um, you have to explicitly grant access, um, modify the XML file. Uh, if you're, if it's a local, if the account is local on the box, you don't need to worry about the domain. If it's a AD domain account, you need to put the domain in and restart. IIS, or at least the web service, after you've changed the RBAC file, otherwise it'll ignore it. And all you basically do for that is, so the, the RBAC file basically lists the commandlets in groups, and then you have a number of users that um, you define and tell it which groups of commandlets it can access. So this one at the bottom, or these two at the bottom, um, One's adding a local account, and the other one's adding a, a domain level account. Okay, so as I've hinted, there's a number of issues with this. The white paper that's mentioned all over the documentation, uh, such as it is, is missing. Um, all of the links either take you off to page not found or um, a page that doesn't have what you're looking for. There's not a lot in the way of usage examples. Um, the example, I can't figure out how to make it support data modification or even if it does. And to come back to the, t the comment about the tools, there's something called the OData Schema Designer. Uh, that, unfortunately, that appears to be bust as well. Um, it, <laughs> It doesn't seem to import the commandlets correctly. I'm still trying to dig into that, and I'm feed, I've got a whole bunch of feedback about this that I'm passing back to the team after this session. Um, in fact, I might just send them the video. It's um, it's there, and it it works more or less. The tools need updating. It needs some examples, and it. It's basically very difficult to use in its present form, but I think if you've got a friendly developer, or even a slightly unfriendly developer that was willing to work with you, sorry, Jim. I can run. <laughs> it, um, I, I think if, you, if you've got somebody that could actually write this for you, I think, I think you could make, make use of it. So where would I see you using this? Um, basically, if you want to come in and do stuff remotely, uh, a possible alternative to PowerShell Web Access, I think on what I've seen so far, PowerShell Web Access has it beat, but um, I think there is some mileage in having an investigate. All right, this one's a bit more fun. Oh, data utils. This came in WMF5. 
It was defined as stable in the February release, um, though there's some additional functionality to come regarding uh, <coughs> associations between data uh, types of data. So you get this module, um, Data Utils. It's got one command in it uh, called export OData endpoint proxy, which doesn't quite win the record for longest PowerShell command name, but it's heading that way. And what this does is generate a set of commandlets for you. So you get new, get, set, remove for each of the uh, resources. So in, in terms of what we've seen, it would be process and um, service. So you get a new service, a get service, a set service, and a remove service. Oh, that could be fun. And um, it generates all of this in a PowerShell module that you can load and use. And you only need to run it the once because the module is stored locally. Um, it's not like the importing the Exchange module when you remote into Exchange and you have to you lose it when you um, break the connection. And the really really good news: it's a CDMX, CD XML based module. Now you all know what CD XML is. No, right. It's a. It's been used a lot in Server 2012, Server 2012 R2, and the Windows 8 family. To take a WMI or SIM, if you want to use the new terminology, uh, class, wrap it in some XML, and you can then publish it as a module. There's talk I did last year, I think. Yep. I think that was actually videoed and it's up on the YouTube channel. If you want to learn a bit more about CDM XML, it'd be worth having a look at that. Um, the, I think the, the, the code downloads from it are still available. If they're not and you want them, drop me a line. I'm more than happy to make them available. And I'll open one of these up in a bit and show you what it looks like. Um, CDX XML uses the object sort of commandlets over objects technology. Um, it was originally introduced so that Microsoft would build a WMI class, then create commandlets for it, and then because they've got a WMI class, other tools could use the WMI class. Uh, so they only have to write one management interface. It's been extended now to cover um, OData utils. I would imagine that over time, this whole uh, commanders over objects technology will just be used more and more because it it, it does make module generation uh, very much easier. So let's have a look at it. And we'll change machine. No, we would if I actually clicked it properly. Okay, so. The way you use it, uh, export OData endpoint proxy. You give it the URI to the um, OData endpoint. In this case, I'm using one out on the cloud that OData.org uh, maintain. Uh, it's OData.org has a lot of input from Microsoft, and it's just they've got a number of uh, endpoints end that you can experiment with. You then tell it where you want to output the module. You tell it that you're running over an unsecure connection. And because it already exists, I'm just forcing it. Uh, this is the bit where I do keep my fingers crossed again. Yes. OK, so that's gone off and it's generated a, a module. So you get a you get a PSD one file. You get some type definitions. You get these CD XML files, and um, it looks like pretty much like a PowerShell module. And if we open up one of the CDMX XML files, and I'll open one of the ones that I'm not going to be playing with just in case I make a mess of it. 
uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. So you've got this commandlet server objects that I mentioned. You need to it needs to have a version. You're giving it some default nouns. You're defining uh, your commandlets that you're creating, and you're starting to set the properties. So things like ID. And uh, query option, and so on, and so on. Things like order, order by, and etc. The ni really nice thing about this is it just does it for you, and it literally is as quick as you saw. Um, do not try and change the XML. Uh, well, you can, but. <laughs> on your own bed, be it. Um, it. This actually works very nicely and generates some quite nice uh, commandlets. If you want to work with CDN, XML, and WMI, it's a little bit more difficult and you're doing a lot more by hand. And then once you've got them, you use them just like any old commandlets. And. In fact, let's, let's just have a look at the module itself. <clears throat> so there's CDMX, CDXML. Oh, nice. So just let me scroll that down so you can actually see it properly. So you can see there you get a set of get commandlets, a set of new commandlets, a set of remove commandlets, a set of set commandlets. So if you've got some OData endpoints in your organization that are uh, giving data up. You can run this against it. You can give it to your end users. You can put it in your scripts. It makes life an awful lot easier for getting to stuff compared to trying to do it by hand. Similar to PowerShell remoting? In this case, no, because you're going against some kind of data. <coughs> uh, on the other so end, you're just translating back to PowerShell. Yeah. In, so that, in that respect, different. yeah, uh, any Anything that you're accessing remotely can be compared uh, with PowerShell remoting. It works in a completely different manner, and it's it, right. but it's the same sort of concept. <coughs> so you, why use one versus the other? There are there are OData endpoints that aren't expressed in PowerShell. Yeah. They might be Linux based. Right. Yeah. And I've I've been using some of this stuff against SaaS providers I have that yeah. run into the yeah. place. So so this, this this you would use against a non PowerShell OData endpoint. The the stuff I was showing earlier with the PowerShell Web Services, that's more a way of exposing PowerShell through OData. Okay. Like uh, you were going to give it to a Linux yeah. endpoint to yeah. interact with your PowerShell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whereas, whereas this case, you're going off to something that somebody's set up. Okay. Um, so if you've used... Uh, I've written wrappers. I used to watch monitor. Yeah. Monitors, yeah. If, you've used, if you've used one get that has uh, an OData endpoint, okay. so you could generate a set of commandlets against that to uh, using OData utils, okay. rather than writing your, your own URIs. Yeah. So does OData normally have a particular type of URL we could use to recognize it, or is there any clue we could look for to know that we could use it? Does, so does OData have any particular type of URL? No, it's no. a, it's a yeah. apart from following the, the sort of REST model that you're giving it the verb, uh, the HTTP verb, so if you're pulling data, it's a get. If you're making changes, it's a po post. If you're updating, creating, it's post. Uh, apart from that, and you, you need to know a little bit about the, the endpoint and the, the spe specific URL. When you run the, uh, the proxy commandlet to generate the, the module, what it's actually going off in the background and doing is interrogating the metadata file that exists on the web service, um, and then pulling, analyzing that to know how to, to create the, the, the commandlets and what commandlets to create. That's why I was saying that if you know that there is an endpoint and you know the, the base URL, running this against it, even if it's only to help analyze it, is, is not a bad idea. Uh, if just as a little aside, it doesn't work against the PowerShell R data endpoint because of the RBAC. 
PowerShell, can't talk to PowerShell. So let's have a look. Yeah, we don't have time. So just pick a commandlet and try it, and it fails because it's telling you it's trying to connect, create an unsecured connection. So you just tell it it can, and you get you can do various things. You, if you looked at the, if you remember when we were looking at the XML, there was a, an order by parameter. What? No, stop. Uh, you can skip off the top couple. <coughs> you can filter, filter by name. So there's a number of parameters that you can use, and we can do. Uh, so, you can, like any other PowerShell commandlet, you, you can get in, you can discover the syntax. Yes, sir. Something just struck my head. That version 5 commandlet that generated all of those commandlets as yep. CDXML file, in theory, that same module over in version 3, couldn't it? Mm. Yeah, in theory. Yeah, that's something to try, I'm wondering, because if the XML file is unique to the commandlet, you just generate, say, raw format, and version 3 understands the format, and you still have the same web service, which has nothing to do with PowerShell. And version three and version four understand. Yeah, uh, I already think government can go to candy plants where I have access to the newer PowerShell, but they can't put the newest stuff in there. Take this, get their web service, generate the yeah. module, hand it off. The only website. the only thing that you'd need to check is if they've made any changes to the underlying yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. command that's over objects technology <coughs> that would that would cause that to. That'd be something to play with there. Yeah, it'd be worth. That's a good idea. It'd be worth experimenting with. Let me know how you get on. <laughs> <laughs> this is my weekend project when I get home. Great. Um, if there are yeah, some data, you will get sort of objects uh, embedded in the objects. So standard call will fail. So you just need to tell it to pull the additional data, and it goes off and does what you expect. So you get something like that. Um, and again, you can uh, order it by price in this case, skip off the top two so you can find what you must things. Associations are one of the things that don't work yet. That's work in progress. So you've got to do something like this at the moment. In terms of updating, Again, the commandlet generates a um, full set of syntax, so you can <coughs> filter the product by the ID, you can set the, the release date, the ratings, etc., etc., et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. The only drawback <coughs> is that the endpoint that I'm using is read-only, so this would fail. So that's what it looks like. Same with creating new ones, it would look that's the syntax for it. You've got a whole bunch of parameter sets in there. And you run it as you would anything else. Can't actually run it because, as I said, because it's a read only endpoint. So, my conclusions about OData and PowerShell PWS, PowerShell Web Services needs a bit more work, needs a bit more documentation, and uh, we need to be able to understand it a little bit better. The PowerShell commandlets, they work fine. OData utils, I think, is a brilliant idea if you've got OData uh, endpoints in your environment that you want to be able to query simply and easily. And I would recommend that <coughs> if you have our data endpoints you investigate and use as appropriate. So my contact details, 
Um, so my blog site, uh, uh, also contact me through pyshaw.org. My email address, uh, contrary to popular belief, I am on Twitter. I just don't tweet very often. And it's not because I'm antisocial, honest. But you are antisocial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, Yeah.